Warning, the video you're about to watch contains mathematics at the level of differential calculus, also known as Calc 1. All material has an assumed prerequisite of pre-calculus and a full semester course in trigonometry. A thorough review of prerequisite topics can be found by searching the web. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all. Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This video is a continuation of graphing using calculus, yet another example. I'm breaking these up into their own individual videos because, well, it takes a while to graph using calculus. These are all the steps that I use. If you want to see those steps or get a description of those steps, please refer to the introduction to this series of videos, which talks about each of these steps in detail. But in this problem, we're gonna tackle graphing this rational function. Now, honestly, graphing rational functions is not something that you want, um, that I wanna waste my time uh, giving to a student in a calculus course, because you've graphed rational functions since algebra two. However, I should showcase an example uh, using calculus to graph rational functions so you can see how it applies here. Going through step by step. Let's talk about the intercepts. So the y intercept. Well, if you let x equal zero, you can easily see y is negative six. That tells me now that I have a point, I'm just gonna go ahead and start listing out those points in a table. So I'll say x versus y here. And as I've mentioned in a previous video, if you uh, need to use a calculator, let's say that you have some inputs, some arguments for your function that are um, irrational numbers and you have to plug it into this and it's not gonna be a nice computation, you're more than welcome to use a, a calculator to approximate the outputs or the Y values that can uh, occur in fact I think we're about to see that here right so the x-intercepts occur when in a rational function the numerator is zero yeah actually that numerator is never going to be zero uh, x squared plus 12 is always uh, greater than or equal to 12 so therefore there are no in uh, x-intercepts none moving through uh, our, our mathematics which would be uh, algebra 2 now domain the domain of this function just using our prerequisite uh, algebra would be all real numbers except for two. So negative infinity up to two, union two to infinity. This tells me a couple things actually. One, we will have a vertical asymptote. Uh, normally, if you could factor that numerator and cancel like factors, uh, and that x minus 2 would disappear, then you don't have a vertical asymptote. Instead, you would have a hole in your graph. However, uh, in this case, that numerator does not factor to have an x minus 2, so they won't cancel. So you do have a vertical asymptote here. Also, it tells me this function has no symmetry. How do I know that it has no symmetry? Well, imagine that your function was even or odd or whatever it is, right? If it is let's just pretend even, and you know you have a vertical asymptote at two, let's just pretend the function looks like this for some reason, then because it's even, you would have a vertical asymptote at negative two. And we don't. We don't have a vertical asymptote at negative two. And the same is true if your function was odd, you would have a vertical asymptote again at negative two. So we can easily see without doing any of the background mathematics that there is no symmetry for this function, which makes that question very easy. Symmetry, none. So we are done with that. Now we go to the vertical asymptote. We know we have a vertical asymptote at x equals two. Now we want to investigate the behavior of that vertical, of the function near to that vertical asymptote and using calculus is perfectly fine. The limit as x approaches that value of two from the left-hand side of x squared plus 12 over x minus two. Let me just double check that that's our function. It is. As x gets really close to two, but from below, the numerator is some positive constant. 
you don't really need to calculate it. It's just some positive constant. And in the denominator, you can see that's approaching zero. However, because you're approaching two from below, so 1.9 or something like that, it's zero from below. And of course, from our earlier work in calculus, we know that this limit will be negative infinity. Perfect. And then using calculus for the other side, limit as x approaches two from the right of x squared plus 12 over x minus two. Again, that numerator is just approaching some positive constant. I don't really care what the constant is. And the denominator is approaching zero. Again, because two, your x value is approaching two, but from above, that denominator is approaching zero. Again, from above. So you have a positive number over a positive number. Well, that's gonna be positive. And it's a constant over something nearing zero. That'll be a positive infinity. So we have the behavior near the vertical asymptote. Now you move to the horizontal or oblique asymptotes. Now we happen to know from our prerequisite material that this is actually going to have a, an oblique or a slant asymptote. However, whenever you make a claim about whether a function has an oblique or a slant asymptote, you need to prove that in calculus. So I'm gonna make just a statement here, oblique asymptote. If you're like, if you're asking yourself, how does he know there's an oblique? Well, what you wanna do, especially with rationals, is long division or synthetic division is perfectly fine. If you use synthetic division here, oops, it would be two, one, zero, and 12. Uh, you bring down the one, multiply by two, you get two, add two, and multiply by four, or sorry, multiply by two, you get four. That becomes a 16. <clears throat> and so we know that this fraction can be rewritten as 1x plus 2 plus the remainder, which is 16, because when you use synthetic division, that last constant is the remainder. So plus that 16 over the divisor, which is x minus 2. If you're not comfortable with synthetic division, you probably should practice that. Synthetic division is a prerequisite for calculus, and it ends up being very powerful for later topics in mathematics. So you wanna make sure that you're okay with understanding why I could use synthetic division here, because long division just takes forever, and you wanna be able to use something that's a little bit faster. You could use long division here. That's not that big of a deal, but there you go. So I'm gonna go ahead and rope this up and just make it disappear because I don't want it in my way. Now I'm going to compl I'm going to claim, I was gonna say complain, but that's not true. I'm going to claim that my oblique asymptote is x plus two. The reason why I'm claiming that is because as x goes to plus or minus infinity, I know that that fraction right there at the very end will disappear. So the long-term behavior as x goes to plus or minus infinity will just be this x plus two. Whoops, that was supposed to be a highlighter, but it just didn't work out for me. So it's supposed to be this x plus two. All right, so that's gonna be the long run behavior. Let's go ahead and make the claim and prove it. So oblique asymptote, the claim is that the oblique asymptote is y equals x plus two. The proof of that claim just follows from our definition of an oblique asymptote. The limit as x goes to, doesn't matter, plus or minus infinity, it's probably best that you cover both at the same time here for this example. You want the difference between your given function and your supposed oblique asymptote, you want that difference to become zero as time goes on. Well, we happen to know that our given function can be rewritten because we did synthetic division as x plus two plus 16 over x minus two. And we're subtracting the quantity x plus two. And you can see the x plus twos will cancel beautifully. And you get this limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of 16 over x minus two, which is zero. 
So we can just write that in, that equals zero. And that is the proof that our oblique asymptote is actually y equals x plus two. That's gonna be useful when we go to graph this curve. All right, so we're done with all the algebra. Y intercepts, X intercepts, domain, symmetry, vertical asymptotes, and oblique asymptotes. If you're wondering how I would ever have known that there was an oblique asymptote here, um, if it wasn't rational, um, the main thing to look for if it's not a rational function is that you have some term that disappears. If you have a term that disappears as x goes to positive or negative infinity, then you might have an oblique asymptote. In reality, uh, I think that most calculus textbooks define the oblique as being a line or a linear function, but you actually can have patterns that are non-linear. So you could have obliques that are like squares and stuff like that. But unfortunately, the book that I use just doesn't uh, cover that level of, of detail. However, I will say the student solution manual does. So it's kind of weird. All right, let's step into the calculus now. We want to start talking about intervals of increase, intervals of decrease, local maximums, local minimums, and then going into the second derivative, talking about concavity and inflection points. So y prime here is equal to, technically speaking, you could actually take either of these versions of y here to take the first derivative, but as terrible as it may seem, I'm going to use the one that involves a quotient rule, mainly because it just keeps everything glued together as a single fraction. And that is kind of important to do with these problems. So I'm going to go ahead and use the quotient rule. The derivative of that numerator is going to be 2x. Oops, that's supposed to be 2 times x. Times the denominator, which was x minus 2. Minus the numerator, which was the quantity x squared plus 12. Times the derivative of the denominator, which was 1, or is 1. All over the denominator squared. And now you can clean this up. This is going to be 2x squared minus x squared, or in other words, x squared. Uh, let's see, minus 4x and then minus 12. And that's all over the quantity x minus 2 and quantity squared. Now, when I go for a second derivative, I will likely, if this, so actually, maybe you should factor first. Let's go ahead and factor, and then I'll make a claim. So this factors to an x minus 6, x plus 2. So all those years of factoring come into play now. And this denominator is x minus 2 quantity squared. The only reason that factoring is useful here is because we want to find out when this first derivative is 0. And when does this first deriv derivative not exist? Well, we can see from the factored form both uh, answers to that question. And rather than writing them out in equation format, I'm just going to write them on this number line. I happen to know that our derivative is 0 at positive 6 and negative 2. I also know that our derivative does not exist at positive 2. But the function doesn't even exist at positive 2. But still, it's kind of important to note because the uh, intervals of increase and decrease could switch at that time. And I even use the factored form when looking at the sign chart that I'm about to build because the factored form is just easier to work with. So think of a number less than negative two, like a negative 10, for example. If you plug a negative 10 into this, first thing you should note, that denominator, as long as X is not equal to two, is always positive. So in this conversation, I'm not even gonna look at that denominator anymore. If you let x equal negative 10, you get a negative in the numerator times another negative, or in other words, a positive. So we get a positive value, which means the function is increasing. Plug in any number between negative two and positive two. Zero is a great one to plug in. You get negative six times two, which is a negative number. So that means our function is decreasing on that interval. Plug in any number between two and six, like four, you plug in a four, you get a negative times a positive, which is again, negative. And then finally, plug in a number 
greater than six, like 10, and you'll get a positive times a positive. So there we go, our function is increasing. Now I'm gonna go ahead and label local maximums and local minimums now. The function went from increasing to decreasing at negative two, so that's a local max. It went from decreasing to increasing at six, so that's a local min. And just note, normally if you have no perspective about this, that derivative, um, or two being a critical number, would tell us that maybe there's a local min or a local max there, but the reality is the function doesn't even exist there, so there's no um, no way for that to be a local min or max. Also, it's decreasing on both sides, so that's also another reason why it's neither a local min nor a local max. Now what I'm gonna do is add those numbers to my table. Every time that I get a number, an X value, that's important, I wanna add it to my table. So negative two and positive six. I'll just go up here and plug in a negative two and a positive six. When X is negative two, we get four plus 12, which is 16 over a negative four, so it's a negative four. Let me just do that mathematics again. Negative two squared is four plus 12 is 16, definitely. Negative two minus two is negative four. 16 divided by negative four is a negative four. And then if you plug in six, you get 36 plus 12, which is 48. And you're dividing that by six minus two, which is four. 48 divided by four is positive 12. So these ones, these numbers are actually nice to deal with. Uh, these these are the first kind of table values that are easy for us. Now, when I go for my second derivative, I will not use the factored form because that creates a product rule inside of a quotient rule. And also, by the way, a chain inside of that. And I just don't want to do that. So I will use the unfactored form, at least the unfactored with the numerator. I'll leave the denominator factored the way it is. That's perfectly fine. So let's see, considering y prime, y double prime is the derivative of the numerator, which is 2x minus 4, times that denominator, which is x minus 2 quantity squared, minus the numerator, which is, now I will just write the numerator in its factored form because that might be helpful later on. So the numerator is actually, <clears throat> excuse me, x squared minus 4x minus 12, but we already know that that factors to x minus six, x plus two. So I'm just writing it this way, just in case something magical happens, which I think it will. Maybe, maybe not actually, now that I'm looking at it. And then we're gonna multiply that times the derivative of the denominator, this denominator right here, and its derivative is two times the quantity x minus two times the derivative of the argument inside, which is one. All right, and this is all over that denominator, uh, which is x minus two squared, squared. Now in this case, um, I'm gonna do a little bit of factoring before I uh, multiply things out. I think a lot of people generally love to multiply things out really quickly, but a good piece of, of advice is don't. <laughs> if you were to factor a two out of this, you would get two times the quantity x minus two. Well, that means we have actually x minus two cubed right there. So you can see it actually is pretty nice. And then minus, and I'm going to bring this two up front here. So two times x minus six, x plus two, and then an x minus two. And this is all over an x minus two to the fourth. So I could factor a two off and I can cancel an x minus two between numerator and denominator. So I'll write this as a two times and then the numerator will be an x minus two squared uh, minus x minus six times x plus two over x minus two cubed. So I guess factoring that x squared, uh, what was it, minus four x minus 12, factoring that didn't really help in this situation as far as uh, rewriting it in our second derivative in factored form, however, it's only took a moment for us to do, and it's only gonna take a moment for us to undo. If you distribute everything out in the numerator, you get x squared minus four x plus four minus x squared minus four x minus 12. 
And that's all over x minus 2 cubed. <clears throat> Combining like terms in the numerator, x squared minus x squared cancels. Negative 4x minus a negative 4x cancels. 4 minus a negative 12 becomes a 16 over x minus 2 cubed. That's actually a very beautiful second derivative. It's very easy to work with. So I'm going to draw my number line. That second derivative doesn't exist at 2. But otherwise, there's no place that could possibly, possibly be an inflection point. And in fact, 2 will not be an inflection point because the function is not continuous at 2. So that's just a little thing to note there. Plug in any number less than 2, like 0, and you will get negative for the second derivative, which would be... Oh, wait, did I factor out a negative 2 or did I factor out only a positive 2? No, I only factored out positive 2. Okay, I just want to make sure I didn't make a mistake on signs here, but I did not, so I'm okay. Uh, so anyway, the second derivative is negative there, so your function is concave down. Plug in any number greater than 2 and you'll find out the second derivative is positive, so it's concave up. Remember, 2 is not an inflection point because the function is not continuous at x equals 2. Now, uh, I didn't gain any more x values that are important, so I'll just go ahead and start graphing. And I'll do so by graphing the x and y uh, coordinate system, or the Cartesian coordinate system, and then above that, I will also graph two horizontal lines to represent y prime and y double prime. So we arrive at this point right here, and I should probably label these axes, axes, right? So there's X and Y. Everything's lined up nicely. Now I'm gonna take a look at my X values that are important. Zero, negative two, six, and remember, positive two, because that's a vertical asymptote. So now I kinda know the scale of my X axes. So I'm gonna go ahead and scale my X axis and also those two horizontal lines up above. All right, so I have successfully labeled those, and I also need to consider the y values. The y values go all the way up to 12 and all the way down to negative six. So I'm gonna probably like uh, set up the y axis to go from maybe negative 15 to positive 15. Okay, I think I have everything ready. Let's label all the information about the first derivative. The first derivative is increasing up to, or the, I'm sorry, the first derivative tells us the function is increasing up to negative two. So I will go ahead and fill that in. We know that it's increasing. By the way, this is negative two right here. And then between negative two and positive two, uh, we know that the function is decreasing. And I don't need that vertical pipe in there anymore. I just needed it to showcase or to let myself know uh, where x equals zero was so I can scale things appropriately. Not that big of a deal. From two to six, the function's decreasing. And by the way, that's two, I just didn't mark it there. And then from six onwards, it's increasing. And I'll even write in here where we have our local mins, local min, and where we have our local max, local max. And then the concavity, it's concave down up to two and then concave up. So it's concave down up to two, concave down, and then uh, up to two and then it's concave up thereafter if you're wondering what these additional little pips are these little marks it's from me trying to um get the the number line on there appropriately but unfortunately uh i'm gonna knock it off of, of there if i if i try to erase so there we go that that works all right so um now i'm gonna plot the points zero comma negative six so let me go to x equals zero and go down six units. I'll use blue for my graph here. So this is roughly zero, negative six, zero comma negative six. And next point that's important to us is negative two comma negative four. So I'll go over to negative two and I'll plot a point at a height of negative four. And I went ahead and used a ruler to help me out there. And then finally, uh, let's see, 6, 12. So let's go ahead and plot 6, 12. There's 6, roughly. Oh, that's pretty good for a 6. So there's where 6 is. And what I'm going to do is actually just cross hash a line here at 6. And 12 is likely somewhere around 
Mm, that's probably 12.5. So 12 might be right, right around here. So, so there's probably where six comma 12 is. I'll just put a little dot there and then erase. There we go. And six comma 12. Now remember my, <clears throat> when I graph, it might go through those uh, points or I mean, uh, go through my handwriting. So be very careful about that. You also want to draw in any vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes and oblique asymptotes and all that stuff. So make sure you do that at this point as well. So we have a vertical asymptote at X equals two. Let me just grab my ruler again at X equals two here. I will dash out a vertical asymptote. I'll pause the video for that. And generally speaking, you want to label it. So I'm going to just write X equals two up above. And then finally, we want to graph that oblique asymptote, which occurred at Y equals X plus two. And I use a green dashed line for um, oblique and horizontal asymptotes. So I'll go ahead. Uh, X plus two is a 45 degree angle. So let me at least get a 45 going on there and I'll zoom in and X plus two. Um, okay. My scale on my axes, uh, it won't be a 45 degree angle because my scales don't match up. So it's going to look like that. That's okay though. Let me just go ahead and make it a little more impressive. All right. So let's go ahead and graph this out. The oblique you could label. Um, some people do, and I think I I'll go ahead and do that. So Y equals X plus two. And now I'm ready to go. I know the behavior on either side of my vertical asymptote is given by my work right here. So on the left side of my vertical asymptote, the function's diving down to negative infinity. And on the right side of my vertical asymptote, it's rising up to positive infinity. So let me at least draw that in. So on the left side, it's going down to negative infinity. Oops, I want the blue ink for this. And on the right hand side, it's going up to positive infinity. Gives me a good guideline. From that point forward, I'm just going to look up here. I know starting the left side, it's increasing and concave down. It's increasing. It'll want to have approached this tangent or sorry, this uh, ob uh, oblique asymptote. It's going to be concave down. And remember at negative two, we have a local max. So it might help you out to do something like this. There's a local max right there. It's concave down at that point. So let's just double check. Our function is concave down all the way up until positive two. So it's concave down there. In fact, it's pretty safe to say it kind of looks like this. It's okay if you've missed that a little bit. And then <clears throat> again, it goes through this. Well, it's a little bit of a sloppy graph, but goes through and it's eventually it is concave down i promise you it'll eventually want to attach itself or get it really close the oblique asymptote just the way i've drawn this it's i'm trying to keep it concave down and so because of that uh, i actually might be able to do it like this there we go there we go that's a pretty good graph it's concave down and my local maximum is still in the same spot so that works out perfectly. Let me erase this extra bit here. And then on the other side of the vertical asymptote, so from two onward, it's decreasing until we get to that point six comma 12 and it starts to increase, but it's concave up forever. So it's concave up and it starts increasing right there. But that's the local mid. So it comes down something like this. It's the question that most of my pre-calc students ask is how would I find out where it hits the lowest value? And my answer is always calculus. That's how you find that out. And this will, it is going to be concave up. It's not going to decrease. It's going to increase, but it's just going to be a slow roll to get to that asymptote. It'll eventually get to the asymptote. It's just going to take forever. Uh, so I should have broadened that out a little bit, but that is a pretty darn accurate graph of this rational function. Again, a rational function is something you could graph back in your uh, pre-calculus course, but um, not with this level of detail. So um, I don't think that most instructors would give a uh, pre-calculus example like this on a calculus exam. Maybe they would, who knows? Um, but I sure wouldn't. I like this on a homework so you get your practice and you can check your work, but 
on an exam is a little too low level for an exam. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes. Obstacles getting in our way comes. Effects more than we can sometimes see. Things for what they are and work together until you feel at peace. Listen close. Don't talk too much. That isn't kosher. You may really hurt inside. It doesn't justify you to speak too loud and cry.